It has now been 14 days since the horrific act of terror by Hamas, a war that has started all kinds of discussions about geopolitics and borders. But more than anything, this war is about people, civilians, human lives. So many families are forever changed. So this hour, we are going to focus on the human toll of all of this, the rescue efforts, the survivors, those whose stories are at the center of this war. That includes the story of freedom, freedom for two women who were captured during the terror attacks, two women we spoke about right here last night. Well, just hours ago, those women were the first hostages released. American Israelis Judith Renan and her 17-year-old daughter, Natalie. Both from just outside Chicago, they were in Israel visiting Natalie's grandmother for her 85th birthday when they were kidnapped by Hamas on October 7th. Natalie's father very emotionally reacted to their release earlier this evening. I've been waiting for this moment for a long time, for two weeks. I haven't been sleeping for two weeks. Tonight I'm going to sleep good. I spoke with my daughter earlier today. She sounds very good. She looks very good. She was very happy and she's waiting to come home. I'm going to hug her and kiss her and uh, it's going to be the best day of my life. Mother and daughter are now in the care of the Israeli military. President Biden spoke to them on the phone earlier tonight, and the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem posted this photo of Judith and Natalie on that call. The story hits home for all of us, especially here at NBC, because last night we found out they're also family members of longtime former NBC foreign correspondent Martin Fletcher. Here's what he told us just about 24 hours ago. Well, I just found out today that two of my wife's family are among the hostages. So I'm so <laughs> sorry. So this is a very personal... <laughs> It's a very personal thing. They, by the way, they're Americans. Natalie, I'm sorry to, just to bring this on you, but I only just found out. Natalie and Judith uh, Renan, they're from Evanston, Illinois. Filled with relief, gratitude, and some joy. Earlier tonight, Martin talked about their release with my colleague, Tom Yamas. The family is celebrating, obviously, because the, the fear was that maybe there was some kind of physical damage to them. But I've got to say one thing. Family is celebrating. I know this sounds incredible. There's another family member who's hostage in Gaza, too. One family member was buried today, killed in the same attack, and another one is still hostage. So this is know, all the same family, all the same family. And this is the story of the families in that part of southern Israel, because there was a certain group kind of people who went to live there in the first place. Two of the Americans taken hostage by Hamas on October 7th have been released. They were escorted over the Israeli border by the Red Cross, but hundreds of other hostages remain in Hamas custody, and the humanitarian crisis across the entire region is only getting worse. Joining me now, Martin Schwepp. He is the Director of Operations for the International Committee of the Red Cross. Martin, I want to start by just thanking you for all that you are doing. Help us understand how urgent is the situation in Gaza right now. Thank you very much for having me. Um, the human misery we've seen unfolding over the last uh, days in Israel and in Gaza is, is really devastating. Um, there's too many people who have been killed, injured, taken away, uh, who are now have been forced to leave their homes. Many of them uh, are forced to sleep out in the open with very little food, water. And so we see a humanitarian situation that is extremely dire uh, and is becoming worse by every hour that goes by. The rhetoric around this war is so heated. What do you want the world to know about the everyday people who are literally caught in this crossfire? Indeed, there's a lot of rhetoric. We need to focus on the human suffering that uh, this 
armed conflict generates for many civilians, children, elderly, um, mothers, daughters that are impacted, deeply impacted by the, the hostilities every day. Um, they should not be the, the center of this conflict. They should be protected. Their rights should be protected. And we call on all sides to respect their obligations under international humanitarian law to protect any civilian from harm. I know your organization is also trying to gain access to the hostages that are being held by Hamas. What are you trying to accomplish? Do you think you can help with their release? What we are insisting is, is on uh, three things in particular, that all hostages should be released. But barring that, we're also working to get access to them, to check on their situation, uh, insisting that they receive what they need. Some of them might need medication or other things. But also advocating that they're allowed to communicate with their families, to send a message to their families. We are in contact with the families, and we see and hear from them how much agony they are going through um, when, when uh, not knowing what happened to their loved one. Even if you do get humanitarian relief into Gaza over the next few days, what do you think the long-term effects could be like? People have lost everything, and Israel hasn't even invaded yet. It's really hard to predict now the long-term effects of what is happening these days. What is clear is that the human suffering is already immense, and the emergent, em, emergency needs are huge right now. Uh, we need to get more help to people who are suffering every day, and every hour the situation gets worse. At the same time, we also know that much of the essential infrastructure is uh, destroyed, deeply affected, and rebuilding that will take a lot of time. Uh, um, but beyond the, the essential services, beyond the water, the electricity, it's also the scars for many families who might have lost a loved one uh, that will take years to heal. Martin, you and your team respond to crises around the world, helping the most vulnerable people in some of the worst situations. How do you stay hopeful, especially at a moment like this when it feels like things are only going to get worse? If you work for the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, by definition, you need to be hopeful. You need to focus on what you can do for people. Each time we are able to reunite a child with their parents, each time we're able to bring information about somebody who has been taken away, who is detained to their family, each time we can improve the access to water, to health, uh, we also see that there is something we can do. There is not only um, despair, but there is also hope that we can help, even in the most dire of situations. Martin, thank you for everything that you are doing. We are sending you love and prayers, and um, good luck in the days ahead. It has been two weeks since the deadly Hamas terror attack in Israel, and we are waiting for a possible ground invasion by Israel into Gaza. At least 260 people were killed at a music festival on October 7th, just miles from the Gaza border. Joining me now, a journalist and a hero, an Israeli radio journalist, Rami Shani. He drove his personal car to the Nova Festival, and he evacuated 30 festival goers while reporting all of it on the air. Um, I, I'm so honored that you're here tonight. Your work, um, what you did as a professional, as a person, extraordinary. Have you spoken to any of the people that you helped since? Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Stephanie, for your coverage, allowing many of us uh, uh, hearing to share our story. Um, well, as you as you know, I, it all started this exact time two weeks ago. I accompanied cyclists who were training there uh, in the Western Negev. At this hour, we started hearing um, gunfire and saw missiles begin to shoot to Israel. We also heard alarm from a nearby village. The cyclist. Exactly. The cyclists very quickly come inside the tunnel beside the road. I put my car uh, in front of them because I understand that the terrorists are exactly nearby and they can be they can shoot 
the cyclists. After uh, about 20 minutes that uh, they were there, I, I tell them to go back to the place where we start the train. And when they were safely, I started to do my job as a journalist. First, I saw a lot of cars, a lot of security cars. It was IDF cars, police cars, and uh, uh, ambulance. So I go with them, and uh, after about five kilometers, I saw a small group of cars. There were a couple of people there, uh, wounded very hard. I go there and try to help them. This is, was the first time. They said that they couldn't move a woman to my car because she was uh, wounded very, very hard in the stomach. I tried to go to bring them help, but I could. I didn't succeed because uh, all the people from uh, Magen David Adom, the Israeli Red Cross, and couldn't go because it was uh, under uh, gunfire, all this area. So I tried to take them to this place, the people, the people who wanted, who wanted, but they, they fixed their car, their car and go there. I help young guy to go to this place, to this uh, safety place. And in the meantime, I saw couple of young people behind the tree. I go back there. I remind you, it was it was all uh, under fire. Everybody was shooting. The police, the army, uh, behind, uh, up of us, there were a couple of uh, helicopters that shoot also was uh, help the people to look for the terrorists. And I go to the tree and call to people to come inside my car. There were a lot of people. And in front of us, about 150 meters, I saw a group of terrorists, armed terrorists. So we quickly leave this area. I bring them to a safely place and go back to bring some other people. Stephanie. Since then, what has it been like for you? Every day, are you reliving that nightmare? Are you in touch with any of those people? Well, they called me when uh, when they saw me uh, interview. Uh, they saw a report. One of them, one of these uh, young people, one uh, uh, celebrated people, called a journalist in Israel, Alon Chachmon. He write her story, and she said, "Well, it was uh, Rami Shani that re that rescued us from uh, this nightmare and take us to a safely place." Since then. It all starts to, to move on. You know, the people uh, start to call me. People uh, said that uh, I have to, to show myself. So uh, my daughter put it in uh, Facebook. And from there, uh, everything starts. They, they start to call me. They said they sent their parents to call me because some of them were go, uh, going to the army. And well, we have we are in touch i hope we find all of them because my uh, fiance want to uh, make a, a big meeting with them after the war how beautiful rami shani thank you for your work thank you for your reporting thank you for saving all those lives